Hi all, welcome to today's webinar. Uh, my name is Matt Cooley from SDL Partners. <laughs> we, we have a, a little bit of a technical hitch where uh, my colleague Phil, Phil Laidler, who was uh, meant to be doing the intros, I think has, has, has suffered a technical error as the webinar starts. So in this day and age, current situation, I think we've all got used to dealing with these kind of things. But I wanted to say hello, thank you for joining us. Um, looking forward to, I hope, a really exciting, interesting, webinar today about a topic that is pretty high up on our agenda, which is Telco Cloud um, and how it is or isn't, depending on how you look at it, important to, to the industry's journey towards adopting 5G. So I myself, um, I'm the Telco Cloud Leader at STL Partners, so I'm responsible for all of our work related to Telco Cloud, NFE, SDN and beyond. Um, done a lot of work with operators and, and their kind of ecosystem of partners on what Telco Cloud means as an opportunity, how we can get there and, and, and how we can know it's being successful. I'll be talking a little bit about what we're seeing from the industry and how well or, or not so well um, Telco Cloud deployments have come to date. We'll also be hearing from my colleague Phil Goddard, um, Business Development Director at Juniper Networks, who'll give a bit of a perspective on how you will go about building a strategic cloud first 5g edge cloud architecture i should just point out uh, that you are in listen only mode unfortunately as an SMD, i'm sure you're all used to this by now if you need I, any I, questions man, man, i'm i'm back so wonderful brilliant timing i managed to get it get the thing crashed um just as i was starting so i i missed the intro but i will take back over this is phil apologies for having disappeared for the first three minutes of the call as Matt was saying, um, yeah, you are in listen only mode. Um, please, if uh, you've got any questions that arise during the course of the presentation, do feel free to enter the questions on the right. Uh, we will be having a Q&A at the end. Don't wait for the end, though, to enter your questions. Do put them in during the course of um, what, what you hear, what you see as you hear it. Um, and just so that everyone knows, we are going to share the slides from today's session. And we'll also be um, sharing back the questions with an attempt to answer those that we've not managed to answer during the course of the call. So, um, you know, do, do enter the questions, do our best to answer them, and we will provide all attendees with both the slides and the summary of those. Right, well, now that I'm, I'm back on the board, um, it leads me to kick off proceedings and um, invite Matt, who stepped in kindly while I was um, uh, off the, the call, to. Um, Take us through sharing his thoughts um, on you know, why has Telco Cloud not met our expectations to date and what it is we need to see um, different for us to succeed with the Telco Cloud and 5G. Matt, please go ahead. Great, thanks, Phil. And no worries at all, all in a day's work. <laughs> so, why has Telco Cloud not delivered, if you look at it in, you know, through certain lens and, and what must change for 5G. I suppose it's helpful, I think, if I just put a bit of context on where we come at it from STL. So my, my day job at STL, I work within the consulting business. So a lot, a lot of our bespoke work, as I said already, with operators and their partners around the world, trying to figure out how and why new technology opportunities matter. We have a particular practice dedicated to telco cloud as, as a theme, as a trend, as a thing that's important to the industry. And I also sort of head up our, our, our strategic efforts around that. What we are focused on within the practice is why telco cloud matters. Sort of learning lessons from what's going on in the industry and where successes and failures have been seen about how we make it happen. And also increasingly, I think, putting some numbers on that. So figuring out what success looks like, how we can measure it and you know what, what the KPIs are. And we do a lot of consulting work. We have a research stream um, and so on and so forth. We also, and this is where you may have sort of had most exposure to us, publish a lot of reports related to telco cloud topics. So NFV, SDN, SD-WAN, all of those are things that we write about, that we think about, that we engage with the operator community about. This particular webinar hinges on um, a report that we've worked on over the last sort of quarter or so. We've gone out and we've spoke, spoken to a bunch of telecoms operators of all shapes and sizes, big tier ones, right down to sort of tier twos and threes in developing nations, trying to get a really holistic view of what the state of telco cloud is in the industry and 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 
and how operators are thinking about it and going about it. Just up front, I think it's helpful if I just sort of do a bit of definition. What do we actually mean by Telco Cloud? It's a term that means many to different people, many things to different people. For us, it's about the move to a sort of cloud software infrastructure. So it's all the sort of trends we hear in the industry at the moment around network virtualization, NFE, SDN and beyond. But it's also augmenting that with, with sort of increasing levels of automation, distribution and and or centralization of compute power, sort of the move towards edge in some examples, API, sort of open ecosystems, all of these kind of things, cloud infrastructure, or to, to support your, your, your telco operations. But it's then about using that infrastructure as a platform to, as one telco exec once said to me, do a Google. So it's adopting the, the business practices that we traditionally associate with, with the big cloud computing companies, your Googles, your Amazons, or, or, or the big cliches, I suppose. It's, it's about agile, innovative, very quick, sort of fast-paced ways of operating your business, innovating new services, putting stuff out to market, so on and so forth. Stuff that traditionally in telecoms, we haven't been great at because of our very kind of capex oriented way of doing things. I sort of build it in where that, and they'll come mentality. Together, those two things, the infrastructure and the business practices that go with it, represent what we think of when we talk about telco cloud so it's, it's it's a philosophy it's a way of thinking and, and evolving your business and we expect it as an industry to deliver big and i'm going to flash up some stuff that you'll have heard a lot about over the last few years and you know you may roll your eyes out to some extent but it's important stuff that we're expecting from this it's it's open ecosystems it's, it's flexibility visibility and control over the infrastructure that the systems that we have out there running our networks, running the different services that we put out to our customers and being able to spin things up and down at will when we want to, so on and so forth. It's, it's about performance at a scale that we've never seen before as we, you know, as we expect data traffic running through telco networks to continue to grow and grow and grow, particularly as we move to 5G. It's, it's being able to deal with that in ways that you know, we've, we've never, sort of never got our head around before. And last of all, as I've already touched on, it's about, it's about being able to innovate on top of that, it's being able to do new things beyond our core business of connectivity, voice, data, so on and so forth, and, and find new ways to serve the needs of consumers and enterprises around the world. Underpinning all of that has always been the question of cost and efficiency. Depending on how you look at it, there is a sort of discussion about whether, whether that's really something we can unlock, but certainly, these four things all feed into the idea that, that the telcos around the world are being asked to do more, um, but for less. And, and Telco Cloud is expected to be a platform that, that will help with that to some degree. Now, early signs are that, that the technology is being deployed. So here is a chart that, that, that extracts at a very high level data from our NFC deployment tracker, which is, is is a service that we have which looks at live, real, so not proofs of concepts and tests, real production deployments of Telco Cloud Tech, NFVI, virtual network functions, SDN and beyond in Telco networks. It's all very evidence-based. We only include what we know is there. The reason I show the chart here today is to, to make the point that it is happening now, particularly over the last two or three years, NFE and everything related to that has sort of gone into the mainstream and Telcos of all shapes and sizes are deploying it. There are examples of operators innovating on that technology platform. A few examples, perhaps. I've pulled out some here from a recent report that we did um, looking at specifically the Asia Pacific market and what operators are doing there. We don't have time to dive into each of these in detail. Um, please do drop stuff in the question, question box if you do want to know a bit more. But I include it to make the point that Telco Cloud is a platform that operators of different shapes and sizes in different kinds of markets um, can use to innovate. So we've got here some very big names in sort of very developed markets within Southeast Asia, but we've also got some perhaps telecoms operators that, that you hear less about when, when, when we're talking about those that lead the way and sort of, sort of are, are paving the way forward in terms of innovation in our space. Um, you've also got brand new operators in Rakuten that we've heard a lot about and that we've written a lot about. 
the point I'm trying to make is that the, this is a potential platform for innovation that, that people are playing with and, and, and where stuff is happening. But what we were asking operators as part of our research is, is whether that's sort of gone mainstream and whether it's, it's, it's really been as universal as, as, as they'd hoped. If you think back to the four um, big ticket diamonds that I just showed you, you know, is Telco Cloud, based on what we deployed, really as open and sort of not locked in, for want of a better way of phrasing it, than, than as, as we'd hoped? Well, what we're hearing is not really, not yet. We're moving that way, but no, long way to go yet. Is it as flexible and, 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 and easy to control automatically and all of this stuff as, as we'd hoped? The answer is no. Again, in pocket, specific use cases and apps, yes, but we don't have that holistic sort of single pane of grass view of, of, of our whole network infrastructure and the ability to, to, to really control that from one place, which is what we really want. We're a long way from seeing it perform at the scales that, 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 that we're expecting. There are signs that certain virtual network functions perform as, as well as or on par with the, the old physical network functions of the past, but we're not yet hearing from operators that they're confident that, 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 that telco clouds can perform as well as they're going to need to in, 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 in future with the, the traffic growth that we expect to see from 5G. And beyond the examples that I've showed you on the last page and, and sort of signs that operators are thinking about how to innovate new services on, on top of the telco cloud platform, there isn't yet much evidence that they can make money from that. And that's, you know, that's the important thing at the end of the day. We're, this has all got to be about fomenting growth. And what operators are telling us is that we don't yet see a clear path to that. Now, so far, it may be so obvious. I think, you know, this, this is a sort of view that, that, that is talking, starting to take hold across the industry. So what we wanted to look at was why that is. And what we, what we concluded was that a lot of it has to do with the way that telco cloud technology has been deployed to date. So we see sort of two broad approaches that operators have taken to deploying Taco Cloud or doing NFE as, as, been, as the case has been in most, for most operators. The first, perhaps the most prevalent, has been what we call a sort of service-led or function-first way of doing things. So operators saying, we have an immediate short-term need around supporting a specific use case. In many cases, that has been, we need to, we're looking at deploying virtual EPCs, like 4G mobile cores, for various reasons, because of traffic growth and because of sort of looking forward to 5G, it makes sense for us to do that. Can we deploy the technology stack to support that? And they built a cloud with that in mind. Other operators on the other side of the coin, and these are probably ones that we've heard a lot more about on, on the world stage, have been coming at it from the point of view that, yes, we have in services we want to support now, but we also want to look a bit further ahead and build, build what they're calling an innovation platform, a single telco cloud that can support whatever we're going to want to do with it over the coming five, ten years, whatever it will look like. So it's a, it's a question of whether they come at it with a particular service in mind or whether they're actually trying to build a platform for innovation. At this point, I was interested to get a bit of context from um, those of you that are watching um, today. I know that there are many um, people from operators that have signed up we're going to do a little vote, it'll pop up on your screen. What I'm interested for you to, to hear is which approach has your organization taken to deploying telco cloud technology? So have you taken, have you looked at things from a service-led point of view? Have you been thinking about things more from a let's, 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 let's build a platform that could do whatever we want with it? Is, it? is it a bit mixed? Have you got different parts of the organization working in silos or have you got multiple platforms emerging or, or no clear strategy at all? So it should, it should have already appeared on your screen. Um, you should be able to click through. I'll give you a few seconds more um, before before we close it and and the, the poll pops up on the screen. You can see we've got about half of people have already clicked through. Give you a few seconds more. So service-led approach, platform-led approach, a mix of the two, or no clear strategy. Another five, four, three, two, one. Closing the poll, and I'm hoping um, that the, the results will, will pop up on the screen. Um, so yeah, really interesting, I think, um, reflection there. Um, 
unfortunately, I can't see the results, but <laughs> we'll have to come back to that later. Um, it's really helpful for us, I think, to understand the context for all of this and, and sort of where we're going um, going forwards. Operators are talking about different ways. What we found in our research, if, if we come back um, to the screen share, is that most operators have come um, at it from the service-led approach. So they've been saying, we, we've got a given need that we're going to um, support. Can we build a cloud to um, do that in the short term? So it's about short-term headaches and dealing with them. What they've tended to do is deploy what they're calling vertically integrated stacks. So what they mean by that is they sort of they tend to be buying a full stack solution from a given given vendor. Often that's a network equipment provider that they've worked with for many years that that offers everything they need to support a given virtual network function or, or whatever it is. So it's really powerful. They're getting a one-stop shop, a single neck to choke when it all goes wrong. It's it's sort of open enough to tick boxes. It's often based on you know open standard open stack, uh, maybe proprietary versions of that. But you know it's 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 based on stuff that's sort of been adopted industry-wide. It works on, alongside what they've already got in place, which is really important. Um, you know, if you're working with a vendor you've worked with for years, you know that they'll be able to tie the new stuff into the legacy stuff that's already out there in your networks. And it performs um, well enough, at least, for, for it to be worth it. The problem is that, that it's, 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 it's sort of short-sighted way of doing things. You know, it's, it's, while it solves an initial need, it's very difficult to expand beyond that. So it's perhaps, you know, it, it might be open stack, but it's not open beyond that. It's very difficult with these sort of vertical solutions to, to, to tie in other party, third party components. It's therefore not very flexible. You know, you, we've seen operators deploying three, four, five different stacks, one for their VPC, one for their virtual IMS, one for the next function, the next function, so on and so forth. They end up duplicating functionality, duplicating infrastructure and hardware. And importantly, what they're telling us is to date, the software apps, the, the network functions are not well optimized for the new environment. They're not cloud native. What we've got is the old physical network functions thrown into a virtual machine. Unchanged, they tell us. I know it's a bit more complicated than that. Things have, things have um, sort of moved on since, but it's, it's, it's not as software first, cloud first, cloud native as they would like it to be. And therefore it's not as well performing as they would hope it would be going forward. So on balance, they tell us those cons actually outweigh the pros. This sort of service led way of doing things works, but it's flawed, it's not a future proof way. On the other hand, you've got the big sort of big groups talking a lot about how they're building innovation platforms and how they're building what horizontally integrated multi-vendor ecosystems where they're, they're inviting um, different vendors in to play different pieces of the puzzle um, and, and build something that works for them, for their needs right now, but also going forward. And it, again, it's a really powerful proposition if, if you can do it. You know, you can make it as open as you like because you're designing it for you from the ground up. You can ensure that it works alongside your legacy and hold vendors to account, making sure that they do that. Quite important based on some of the conversations we had is that, that there are performance um, improvements that can be seen by sort of trying to build ecosystems like this. You know, we, we, we hear of big tier on operators inviting three different PNS vendors onto their platform saying, we're going to pitch you against each other and we're going to pick the one who, whose solution performs the best and, and, and sort of signs that they've seen fourfold um, throughput increases, for example, as a result of flogging them. I use the, uh, the operator's word there, not mine. <laughs> um, however, there are several drawbacks. It's still not very cloud native. Those cloud native functions don't really exist yet. And nor do the sort of control and orchestration capabilities, solutions that operators are looking for to tie all of this stuff together. The, 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 you know, the vendor community isn't quite ready for that yet. But also, it costs money. It, there is no big single neck to choke when it goes wrong and a big SLA attached to that. And you need to throw people, time, skill sets at it to make it work, which makes it inaccessible, I think, to, to, to many outside of the sort of handful of operators that, that tend to come out at the top of um, lists of you know, innovation leaderboards that have the money to throw at it. So again, on balance, it's expensive and you need to do it for yourself. There's no blueprint that applies across the board. 
everything at the end of the day boils down to three key things that the industry needs to address if, if we are looking to, as an industry, build a telco cloud that works for everyone. The first bucket, I haven't spoken about too much, but in, if you, depending on who you talk to, it's, it's more than 50% of the problem, in fact, is about telcos getting themselves in shape to adopt to adapt to a new software first way of doing things. And there are a whole host of organizational, strategic challenges and obstacles for them to overcome in, in order to, to do that. Many are struggling, and I don't just mean those that are, you know, um, that have less money and resource to throw at this. Also those who, who are often coming at the top of those leaderboards I was talking about, those who have invested time and people and brains in this. There's a lot of change that has to happen to the way that the telcos operate. It all comes back to this digital transformation thing we've been going on about for years now. But but it's it's important, as, as sick as everyone has got about it, it, it's important that we figure that out. Otherwise, telco cloud will never work. Two things that are a little bit more external, though, is that what telcos are telling us is we need to see more movement on the cloud native stuff and the, the, the capabilities around management and orchestration methods the mano functions that, 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 that we need to control, these, you know, to really sort of automate, control, have the flexibility we need in these ecosystems. We are not seeing that out there in the marketplace yet, and, and, and we need it soon. There's been a lot of movement in that space recently. I'm sure Phil uh, later on will talk a bit about his perspective on that. Last of all is, 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 is cross-industry collaboration integration, which is something we've been traditionally very good at as an industry. We're good at standards, we're good at sort of working groups and bodies and frameworks and all of this kind of stuff. And there are many in the NFE, telco cloud, cloud native space. The problem is that, 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 that traditionally they move a bit too slowly for what we're seeing, you know, the sort of the pace of, of evolution right now. And operators are saying, we are tearing our hair out, trying to figure out a better, more efficient, um, way of doing things that works for everyone. I wanted to sort of change tack at this point and say, great, yeah, these are the things we need to do, but 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 does it really matter? And sort of bring it back to a conversation I had recently with a strategy executive, a tier one operator, who said, right, great, you're going on about all of this, but who cares? You've been talking about Telco Cloud for the best part of a decade now. You know, you consultants, you know our vendors coming in here telling us it's going to you know it's going to change our businesses for the better but we haven't seen it yet isn't this just snake oil which <laughs> quite a, you know quite a, he put me on the spot a bit there he's sort of saying justify your job and uh, you know it's a challenge i'm happy to take on there is some truth in that it's telco cloud and the sort of move toward this is something that, that we have been going on about for a long time and it's true that if we haven't seen it perhaps deliver today you could question where the, where the validity is in it you know beyond tech teams sort of, you know, leveraging um, NFP and, um, and sort of getting their head around a load of three letter acronyms. How does this matter to the, the broader telco organization? What does this mean to marketing teams and those who are actually dealing with customers on the front line and this kind of thing? Why should they care? My argument was, well, yes, you're right, but there is a compelling reason to care right now, and that is 5G. I'll just float up the chart here that comes from some of our research into 5G. The colors represent sort of when 5G is expected to appear in those markets and you've seen lots of different flavors of this chart from lots of different analysts and vendors out there. And the reason I include it is to make the point is that most of the world has committed for right or for wrong to rolling out 5G networks. The rest of the world is inevitably going to follow. Money is being spent on 5G new radio. But the business case for that has been justified on all the cool stuff that 5G is going to enable you to do, but the radio alone isn't enough to cover. And that's, you know, the, the sort of edge compute use cases, the private network slices, all of the sort of really interesting, exciting stuff beyond core connectivity, beyond mobile broadband that, that we've never been able to achieve before. And those things are just not possible without the cloud infrastructure in place. They'd be designed with all of that in mind. So our argument is, 5G means you have to care, and this is the time as an industry that we have to pull together and make it happen. With that said, I'm going to wrap up and hand over um, to Phil G to talk a bit about how he thinks we can go about doing some of that stuff. So I imagine there'll, there'll be lots of questions. We can come back to the end. Please, please shut them in the comments box if you haven't um, already. And with that, over to Phil. 
Jim, so, folks hear me. me. Nope. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, Phil. Yeah. No, well, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for uh, handing off there, Matt. Uh, that's terrific. Let me just uh, uh, take control of the uh, screen. Have I got screen now? I'm hoping I do. Let me know. Yes, you do, Phil. Okay. Why is it not going into presentation mode? There we go. Right. Can everybody see uh, a green screen, as it were? Uh, not yet. Not yet. While we're waiting on that, um, this is Phil Laidler. I just want to invite folks to submit their questions um, from that came out of the, the um, presentation that Matt just gave. And please do feel feel free to do so during um, Phil Goddard's uh, presentation. And you do that on the control panel on the right-hand side. You'll see there's a little area for questions. Just pop in your questions there and we will be reading them during the presentation and processing them and getting them uh, as far as we can, trying to get them answered in the course of today's session. Those that we don't actually manage to, to tackle um, today, we will uh, attempt to respond offline and send the answers to everyone. Um, so do, do please, anything that comes to mind, do please submit that, give a little bit of feedback um, and try and cover that off this call. Um, we're still not getting, I'm not getting anything yet, Phil, in terms of your presentation. How's that show? Here we go. There we go. Okay, so it looks like I figured out how to work the controls here. So, folks, Phil Goddard here. Uh, thanks very much for uh, coming to listen to us today. Uh, and uh, let me just get right to it. So, as Matt outlined, um, there's different approaches that may be taken to truly unlock the potential of the cloud enabled infrastructure. And while there's really been no definitive list of factors that unerringly indicate the path a service provider is going to take, we do know that such things as the state of their technology, the, the depth of their technical expertise, and the maturity of their operational process actually do figure prominently in their decision. I mean, truth be known, a good many service providers out there today are still developing their telco cloud shops. And there's truth to be the, to the statement that, look, good help is hard to find. And even once you find it, it's even harder to retain. Every service provider is going through this fire drill right now. Many a strategic journey I've actually witnessed have been derailed by the irresistible urge to grab a quick victory, um, you know, tactically within reach, uh, especially when the immediate future looks a little grim. And anybody who's gone down this path, they've had some grim nights uh, in front of them in, in terms of getting all this stuff up and functional. But regardless of path taken, it's important to acknowledge, look, Telco Cloud is hard. Um, and so why is it hard, you ask? Well, glad you asked that question. There's actually two broad categories of challenge that seem to surface pretty consistently in my experience. And I've been at this now for, well, the better part of mm, five plus, six plus years, okay? The fine door number one, we have what I describe as the com uh, composite application workload, the virtual network function themselves, and they are simply amongst the most difficult and unruly lot to operate well at scale on a cost-optimized COTS infrastructure, okay? Behind door number two, we have the new op automated operational model, and I will tell you quite candidly, this has turned out to be a real snake pit for the unwary SP. I mean, if I could mix my metaphors, this is, you know, this is like an iceberg. The real danger truly lurked beneath the surface. And in fact, um, I actually believe quite strongly this was a, one of the contributing factors that aided the adoption of what I described as a function first approach. And this always brought me back to a familiar refrain with opportunities that uh, I connected with directly. Look, if all you do is virtualize and carry on with the same old operational model, don't be shocked when there's, you know, when you discover in the end, there's very little payback on the investment. So it might seem pretty harsh, but, you know, I think it's an important reminder to bear in mind for all those folks you know, still starting out or still pretty early on in their own cloud journey. Anyhow, did I tell you, Telco Cloud is hard. So let's move on. Oh, I thought I had it there. Uh, have I lost control? No, there we go, okay. So as I mentioned, cloud is a pillar of transformation. Uh, cloud is a pillar of transformation and a fundamental component in realizing the potential of 5G. But there's also some real tangible benefits that any engineering or operations manager are going to appreciate when they consider today's mode of business. I mean, many of the today's solutions were, you know, 
purpose built on custom hardware. And they're driven by software stacks that are highly customized, generally monolithic in construction, and very often wound up in a lot of customized control and telemetry wrappers. I mean, this is your classic infrastructure box that we've all come to know and realize this is the thing that we've got to replace. Okay. And as, as the industry uh, uh, virtualized, the, the, the vendors of this technology, the VNF vendors, um, actually followed the path of least resistance. They carefully impact their applications from that nice cocoon they built up over the last 20 years of their, their appliance. And they literally reconstituted these, these, uh, the software elements almost exactly within the cloud environment. The line cards of their platforms became virtual machines in the servers. The fabric connecting the servers became the virtual chassis backbone. I mean, I needn't explain the impact of performance of moving from custom software that, uh, uh, to a COTS platform, nor the replacement of multi-terabit backplanes for merchant uh, silicon-based switch fabrics. Anyhow, in an effort to address the performance dip, you know, and, and the added complexity of now that everything is virtualized, they optimize the entire environment around a particular VNF. They smartly reseal the outcome up into a single SKU and quickly move forward with the shiny new vertical stack solution, or as we describe it, the function first solution. Now, on the one hand, they did deliver a virtualized solution using traditional cloud data center building blocks, yay. But on the other hand, it could be said that they really kind of failed. I mean, they replaced the high performance solution for a lower performance one. Then they papered over the performance by adding servers and larger fabrics. You know, the thing we call the new scale out. I mean, seriously, it was a good time to be selling servers. And then they left the old operational model intact, leaving behind more hardware elements to operate and a variety of additional support costs to boot. I mean, the biggest surprise of all though, was that they successfully avoided, and I mean completely, delivering any of the fungibility or agility that was the prime, or it was the real promise of cloud-enabled solutions. I mean, from my perspective, I describe this as the proverbial faceplant moment, or perhaps in keeping with the theme of today, the virtual faceplant. And then it got hostile. But eventually this led to some real introspection on the part of the service providers that went down this do-it-yourself model, as it were. Let's just revisit what we want and need out of the telco cloud and why as an industry we're betting on it in the future, okay? It's certainly not about replacing legacy function with new version of the same thing that runs on less expensive and correspondingly lower performance hardware. Sure, everybody thinks they're gonna get some kind of a CapEx savings, but there's really, this is really not a direct CapEx containment strategy. Telco cloud is viewed as both a path upon which the service provider will be able to realize the full potential of their investment in new services, but also at a pace and on a cost model, much more in line with that of a hyperscaler. It's about time to market, time to revenue, and it's about the ability to pivot at a moment's notice. It's about embracing the cloudification for the infrastructure. And for service providers that are embarking on the 5G journey, well, I'm, I'm sorry to say there's, there's really no alternative. I mean, this is a tough pivot. Hyperscalers were not burdened with the baggage of history here that today's service providers carry. And if service providers are gonna grow and thrive, they have to transform their infrastructure and their business process and the people from a model that was used to be multi-year time horizons with very few really large bets to inserting code changes into live networks on an hourly basis. I mean, this is generally when I used to see the blood drain from people's faces and, inside of traditional service providers. So let's take, a, uh, take this a step further. Um, with a simple example, just to drive the point home. The example is very important because this is where I've often heard the complaint you know, from the service provider, this is killing us, where's the payback? Take a look at an existing mop that defines steps to accurately and consistently perform you know, what is otherwise a very mundane run-of-the-mill tasks. But now let's consider doing it again, okay? And take a look what happens when we, when we make this change. We're gonna make it more interesting. Let's make it virtual. And remember, we're still trying to use the same old operational model. As you can see, we experienced multiple issues, usually at every step with what was once considered the gold standard in process and procedure. And it all ends up in tears. Well actually frustration. Now, despite the exaggeration of the example, 
there are two critical points worth mentioning here. Point number one, the old MLP, if it's not obvious now, just simply won't work. Minimally, every MLP will need to be prefaced with how do I find the virtual equivalent of X? Trust me, I've seen this stuff written down like this. Or worse, every step will need to be written, written and validated. You know, I have to tell you, this reminds me uh, of an episode I actually endured. Within a lab environment that was being set up, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> I witnessed someone painstakingly labeling, <coughs> pardon me, I think so, take the water down the wrong pipe there, uh, painstakingly relabeling the identity of workloads that were going to be placed on each server so that they knew where to find them just in case they needed to work on them. You might imagine the shock and horror on the face when it was explained to them that, you know, workloads within cloud infrastructures might be moved. Hell, they might even be moved by the infrastructure themselves for any number of reasons. And then point number two, your operations staff will need to have their skills upgraded uh, in a serious way. They'll need to include a serious work and knowledge of, of servers, NICs, um, operating systems hypervisor, hypervisors on top of their usual day-to-day -day skills. Now, I'm sure all of you folks have a funny story or two of your own to share, but seriously, it must be understood that there is really, really no way around it. Unless the business process is transformed, and that means the methodologies and the people skills, it's extremely difficult, if ever, to realize the full potential of Telco Cloud. And the only way to do it is to do it deliberately right from the very start. Um, let's move on to the next one. While I've been talking about Telco Cloud for a few minutes, it's worth pausing and reminding ourselves of all the critical components of a Telco Cloud. I mean, if we start right at the bottom, we have the hardware platform and the forwarding plane. Now, Telco Cloud has a very unique forwarding requirements and SLAs that need to be met. So every modern Telco Cloud is gonna use a mix of processor types, obviously from the, the general purpose x86, but all through, also uh, along with the uh, you know graphics processing units as well as custom ASICs, both in the server as well in the, as as in the NICs to match the service or application requirements. You know, moving up the stack, you hit the fabric, the home and the switches and routers that provide the physical connectivity between all the local compute and storage resources and the wide area beyond. A high performance, low latency, seamless interconnector, the watchwords here. And I have to underscore the seamless interconnect. This seems to be a, a still a troublesome spot for a lot of folks. Next, we move up to the orchestration virtualization layer. You guys can read as well as I can. To me, this is where all the magic occurs. Ultimately, the underlying fabric and hardware platform should all be invisible to what's going on at this orchestration lever, layer. Finally, we have the services layer. Um, this is where we define and code. This is where your VNFs sit. This is where your services uh, sit, like you know, 5G gaming services or new packet cores, that kind of thing. Now, oftentimes, each of these layers is managed by you know, specialized sets of teams. And I've, I've seen service providers reorganize on a frequent basis to try and get their resources aligned up with, with some of this stuff. It's, it's fascinating to see. Um, this operational interdependence can make the transition to cloud difficult because in order to get it right, all of these layers really need to be singing in harmony. To do this, we need network services and functions, like you see on the right, um, that we can use that will cut across all of these layers. Ideally, we want to define once and deploy across a cloud platform and not define many times at every layer. So let's talk further about the must-haves and consider that we need to consider when we, we're talking about building a, a, a telco cloud. First is the edge and service agility. Here we're talking about the ability to deliver any service from any cloud site in the network at any time of the day, month, or year. To deliver any service from any vendor, the cloud form has to be horizontally aligned and built upon standards with published APIs to make it easy to spin up and quickly deliver services. Uh, the cloud has to support virtual machines and containers equally well and needs to have a clear path to supporting cloud native and there should be choice available on consumption model. I mean, we can build and hand over, or we can build and operate. There's a lot of small operators out there that just don't have the wherewithal to take this, uh, take this burden on, yet they have no other choice. They have to move or die, all right? The next, uh, the next uh, uh, pillar to consider is the simplified operations. I, I know 
we all know that things need to be easy to drive. Um, but really, we're, we're kind of still stuck in, in some process inside. We need to move away from the process heavy waterfall oriented models that we've been using, and we need to embrace the automation, not test it, not try it, but really truly embrace it. Okay, the goal here is to eliminate as much of the repetitive and overhead, manual overhead that we can through automation that is both scalable, and this is critical, and maintainable. Okay, that enables us to concentrate our most valuable operational assets, the humans, on the highest value tasks. Finally, we've got the obligatory service assurance. Now, this is an idea that was established at a time when services were anything but virtual. It's all about discrete devices connected together in very specific ways and benchmark. Systems were created, were assured to deliver services at a specified uptime. Now, in today's world, where we have lots of virtual this and that, we still have systems of objects that need to be cobbled together and must be assured to delivering services at specified uptimes. But we've got a couple of notable differences. We very likely don't know exactly where these objects are from one minute to the next. This is cloud after all, and how they might be affecting each other or their immediate state with respect to their surroundings. So then how do we do in this infrastructure what we used to do in the old? Where do we start? The good news is, this isn't really entirely a new challenge. The early days of server virtualization produced lots of log data stats and alarming that were ingested by server monitoring systems and helped operators isolate infrastructure problems, hopefully in a time period that allowed them to fully remediate. Well, let's fast forward to the world of the future. Well, today, for instance, where latencies of more than a few seconds can mean the difference between a VNF meeting an SLA or failing altogether where the original server monitoring software is now several orders of magnitude too slow to be of any use, where human intervention and remediation loop becomes the long pole in the tent of effectively resolving problems, or worse, maybe the human resolves a problem or a condition that doesn't even exist anymore, okay? I mean, the punchline here, folks, is not only do we have to get away, or not only do we need real-time telemetry, but we have to get away, get the humans away from, from remediation. We really need real-time remediation, and we really need to lean on our infrastructure for that. Let's talk about the service edge, and uh, let's talk about the edge and service agility. Look, 5G opens the door to a whole new set of revenue-generating apps and services that depend on the availability of low-latency and high-capacity network. Apps like gaming, connected vehicles, remote surgery, they can only be delivered from a, a highly distributed edge. And if we're going to capitalize on it, we need to have agility to develop and to scale at any, uh, any new service or application in a consistent way and deliver a ubiquitous experience across the entire set of edge assets. We have to do it cost effectively. So while building a fully distributed cloud infrastructure inevitably means deployment of many distinct clusters, as you push further out to the edge, your clusters generally shrink in size and before too long, it becomes painfully obvious that the amount of server infrastructure being devoted to command and control begins to represent a not so inconsequential portion of your server deployment. And now along with the headache of spiraling costs associated with this, you become doubly burdened with the challenge of how to effectively manage a sizable population of servers and switches and fabrics and clusters as a more or less cohesive entity. Now the good news is there's an answer to both. With respect to the command and control problem, the notion of aggregating multiple clusters per site is not a new concept. But the notion of aggregating multiple sites per cluster is by enabling workloads to be geographically displaced from the central control point, it's now possible to reduce uh, you know, the overall number of distinct clusters and remove significant amounts of servers devoted to that command and control function. And do not underestimate the magnitude of this problem. A distributed, distributed edge counts, the core count sites, they could easily be a thousand to one. And the number of servers per distributed edge could average less than a rack full. So it doesn't take long to start piling up a lot of servers that aren't generating a lot of revenue. Now to effectively uh, manage this sizable population of servers, fabrics and customers, um, that, that is a problem that has perplexed service providers for a while. The interesting part of this is software developers, as part of any organized code development effort these days, have actually been driven to work with large sets of files for years. And so consequently, they developed uh, version control tooling to help them manage such a problem. As it turns out, the same principles of tooling can, can be applied to managing groups or sets of telco cloud, co 
clusters. Being a pop, Git being a popular open source tool, uh, version, con version controlling tool has been co-opted to the task. And actually in the spirit of what's going on here, I mean, uh, in, within the new nomenclature, uh, you know, the term GitOps has started to emerge and be coined to describe this approach. But with all that said, what happens if you simply don't have the wherewithal to pull this all off on your own? After all, it can take years to accumulate this kind of expertise. Well, you know, you see that uh, that blob on the right-hand side. Uh, you could always think about uh, partnering with a hyperscaler or three, you know, um, or you can, and simply outsource the whole entire edge altogether. But it's really a double-edged sword. Certainly, they give you the time to market you're looking for and a lot of applications. But how long does it take before their brand simply overwhelms your own? potentially relegating the service provider back to the pipes or us value proposition. It's quite possible instead of capitalizing upon and protecting what is arguably some of your most valuable assets, you could be letting the fox into the hen house here. In response, you know, Juniper, uh, we've recently announced a partnership with a company called StackPath, global provider of managed edge cloud services. And while we'll be combining our mutual strengths to deliver a managed edge cloud solution, um, you know, I'm not going to make the focus of this uh, discussion about any of the details there. We'll, we'll talk about that in some coming uh, presentations. It's our intention with this partnership to uh, uh, complement what we're doing uh, in Telco Cloud Solutions with the addition of a fully managed debt solution. So we want to provide the service provider with a, with a comparable offer uh, without the associated concern of potential loss of control of those valuable edge assets. All right. Um, Shifting gears to operations, um, we look at today's operating environments and we're driven mostly by siloed independent operating teams. Okay, these teams act autonomously from each other, but in fact, they're actually aligned by common goals and objectives. As an example, if we want to develop and deliver a network service that has certain characteristics, um, we imperatively tell each team how to implement their portion of the service and voila, we actually have a, a service. When everybody is done and they're given the thumbs up that they're ready to go, we start service validation testing. But if we have a test failure, we stop, we triage, we recause, we fix a problem, we test, we commit, we try new code and we try again. And we continue and we rinse and we repeat until the service is qualified for production. Sometimes this can take months. Sometimes it can take even longer if we discover new features are required. But, if we take a look at cloud infrastructures, we shift our approach completely. We move away from the usual imperative style to the new declarative style. Instead of programmat programmatically configuring the infrastructure in a very prescriptive fashion to deliver an environment suitable for applications, we instead describe our needs to the, uh, of the application of the infrastructure. And we allow the environment to deliver out of its available pool of resources what we need. So instead of telling the infrastructure how to set it up, we tell the infrastructure what we want and we let it determine. Now, so as before, if we define the how the configurations where we implemented our, our ops teams, we now, we now declare what we need. And in the case of uh, the network service we described, we just say we want uh, a resilient high bandwidth network slice with some specific characteristics. With the right uh, automation tooling, we have the ability to take the declaration of intent, convert it to code, we compile it, we execute it by way of our, our uh, CI-CD pipeline, and we affect the change within the infrastructure environment that will enable it to select the, and make available, and this is important, the optimal resources available in the moment that meet the requested operational characteristic. Now I say that in the moment because we should be able to do this at different moments of the time, you know, the day, night, the weekend, whatever, and the network, has the, uh, has the flexibility or should have the flexibility to be able to select different resources that may be available at that moment in time. That's the power of the cloud, okay? You can add to this um, things like artificial intelligence and machine learning, which will further enhance the overall experience in a number of distinctive ways. Uh, baselining what is normal. Very often when these clouds are built, um, there's a great amount of testing that has to be conducted to figure out what is the, you know, the baseline uh, normality of available resources. Well, why don't you use machine learning to figure that out? It does it much more quickly 
And in fact, what is normal in one particular cluster may not be exactly normal in another. Um, using artificial intelligence, we can refine the declared needs of applications over time. Sure, applications come from their VNF vendors, uh, and they'll tell you exactly how many you know, servers you need, what kind of processor performance they're gonna demand, what kind of memory they're gonna demand. But the reality is the applications uh, vary on their demands based on load. So wouldn't it be good if your infrastructure could figure that out and recalibrate over time? Other things that uh, are available to you with these kinds of technologies is the ability to identify sources of anomalous behavior. Um, this is a particular challenge in these, in these environments that have SLAs attached, where there's a lot of phantom problems that are hard to track down. And what you need is something that's constantly watching this at a holistic level um, to really be able to auto-remediate and recalibrate on the fly. From our perspective, intent-based operations, as I like to describe this, is really about describing operational characteristics under which your applications are gonna perform over time and letting the infrastructure just do its thing in response. Okay, we mentioned network slicing in, in our last example because it's really compelling um, with use cases across every, every industry. Through slicing, we can offer diverse services with specific performance, latency, and resiliency, and we can, we can tie them to you know, tiered pricing models and target whatever market we like. Okay, regardless of the, the quality of the service that is defined by the slicer, the, the spectrum is no longer going to be carved out in the last mile. The integrity of the, the slices SLA is going to be reliant upon a consistent service delivered across potentially the entire infrastructure. As per our last slide, we use a declarative approach. We can define is what we need from the infrastructure and allow the infrastructure to use its tools to stitch together, you know, um, specific LSPs in the wide area to VXLAN flows in the, in the, inside the data center. In a comparable way, we can define quality of service and security postures that we would like to have the infrastructure impose. And we can be comfortable that as the workloads move, the associated posture moves along with it. And finally, we can rest comfortably that telemetry and analytics, the, uh, with telemetry and analytics, the infrastructure will be able to determine for itself when it's running abnormally, hot and uh, uh, figure out ways to naturally recalibrate without human intervention. I guess folks, in summary, look, telco cloud is hard, there's no shortcuts. Virtualization without a corresponding business transformation is simply a sizable sunk cost with no payback. The initial wave enabled us to get familiar with the overall challenge and build the muscle to ensure for a soft landing on the infrastructure workloads. The coming wave really boosted by the arrival of 5G and the new frontier at the edge will be no less daunting, but the challenge will subtly shift. While the workload placement and the operational process are gonna be crucial, the focus of effort is gonna shift in the direction of managing the many and varied distributed cloud nodes at scale and at a pace in line with the hyperscaler. Look, Juniper's telco cloud solution is really a combination of many different aspects of Juniper's software and hardware portfolio, coupled with maintainable automation at all layers to achieve a cohesive, reliable pool of both hard and soft resources in which to place and execute your infrastructure services in a fully distributed manner, reliably and at scale. That's what we do at Juniper. We deal with the hard problems. Give us a call. I'm sure if you have something, I'm sure we've got something in our portfolio that's gonna help you along your journey. Thank you. Thank you very much, Phil. Um, and we, we are, uh bit approaching the top of the hour. So there are lots of excellent questions, some of which you've actually answered during the course of the presentation. So we've got time perhaps for just a couple of these. Um, and I, I guess um, I guess the first one I think I want to pick up on is, um, it, it has been covered, but I, 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 I'd like you to, to tackle again. There's, there's Kelvin um, and, and Jean-Marc, they both asked a similar question, which is, um, to what extent uh, operators can work with the hyperscalers uh, such as AWS and Azure to to uh, to bring about a hybrid telco cloud to enterprise customers? And related to this question, John Mack was asking, um, other than partnering with um, AWS and Azure, um, can aggregation platforms uh, such as Mobile AJX or Edge Gravity um, do you see them um, having a role? This is this is a slightly different take on telco cloud. They're looking more at uh, Work workloads other than just network function workloads, but I thought those were two quite interesting questions regarding 
um, how does Telco Cloud work with or alongside um, uh, other clouds, hyperscales in particular? Well, to answer, answer um, the first question, um, yeah, go sorry, ahead. Sorry, do I, have, I still have the mic? Okay. So the answer is certainly the multi cloud requirement of working with the high hyperscalers is going to be very important. And it's clearly going to be important at the edge. Um, People talk about low latency at the edge as the, being the primary uh, motivator for building out um, um, powerful compute capability there, but there's a secondary capability and that's really network offload. Um, so in fact, um, that, that's gonna be an important characteristic to develop at the edge, which is not simply connectivity to you know, the hyperscaler of, of, of your choosing, but probably a mix of hyperscalers depending upon how they how they uh, focus their own their own business, what they're going to specialize in, and they're all specializing. They don't want to look like each other, so you're going to go to different hyperscalers for different reasons. Um, and quite honestly, that's that's got to happen uh, more deliberately at the edge than probably anywhere else in that environment. So certainly at Juniper, um, we see a build out of, of telco cloud infrastructures that will have to have an ability to connect to those hyperscalers. It's squarely in our gun sites. Um, okay, just, sorry, just following on from that, um, there's a question that Kelvin raised about edge and central cloud and whether there are any, if you can very quickly summarize any key differences in terms of deployment strategy or business drivers that, that you would highlight regarding edge and central cloud. Um, really probably the big difference is the fact that there are so many more of, of uh, those cloud locations. Um, the service provider, re this is really where the service provider needs to focus a great deal of attention on, on the automation required to manage all of those uh, sites as a collective entity. That's going to differentiate from how they're probably managing those handful of central, very large sites. And the second piece, obviously, be there is as these sites get smaller and smaller, um, the cost of the overall uh, command and control aspect to these becomes not inconsequential. You have to deal with it. So you have to look for innovative ways to get around it. At Juniper, okay. we simply remove it. Okay, thank you. And then um, just for conscious time, last question, interesting question from Girish, which I think um, is, is really just trying to bring a bit of topicality. Do we think that the current situation, um, obviously we're all familiar with in the world, do you envisage any change in either the 5G, yeah all the cloud strategies that telcos are considering. And I think I can direct that to both um, you, Phil, and to Matt, briefly. In yeah, the I mean, if, I said we, we've spoken a bit about this internally. It's too early to tell. I mean, we do know that enterprises are increasingly concerned about how they can ensure that a very newly distributed workforce that they have can actually perform their roles as usual. And there is interest in the idea that 5G might have a role in sort of enabling that, enabling the sort of assuring that, I suppose. Um, but you know, our conclusion was we're probably not going to be able to do that until the next crisis like this. What, it's going to be a little bit of a question of whether the situation we're in now is, is, is going to change things forever, as some are predicting, or whether, whether we will return to business as before and life as before. And if we find that, 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 that what, we, what comes out of all of this is that, that working patterns across the world change, I think that, that there is going to be a increased role I guess for 5G in it and, and you need the cloud to support that. I don't know Phil if you see things a bit differently. Um, no I'm, I, I see things um, uh, really going down the path of, of more horizontal uh, cloud deployments and I see service providers really pressing the case for um, the vertical stack solutions being unpacked um, and, and more easily mm. gotten to inside their infrastructures. I think uh, movements like uh, Open RAN are going to be a significant motivator to see more of that happen. So I think that uh, clouds are never, these kinds of telco clouds are going to get inevitably easier to manage and more pervasive. Okay, thank you both. We have definitely run out of time. I'd like to thank um, both our speakers. Uh, I'd like to also um, thank Juniper who sponsored this webinar. Uh, I'd like to thank all the attendees for their excellent questions. We will aim to answer all those questions. We will try and get back to you with our responses to those um, in the next sort of couple of weeks. And we will obviously be sharing this. Thank you, everyone. Stay safe and look forward to hearing and, and, and um, seeing more of you join us on our upcoming webinars. Bye. Thank you.